Good evening. I'm Iris Bonnet, the academic dean here at the Kennedy School. It's with enormous privilege that I welcome our guest of honor tonight, His Excellency Jens Stoltenberg of Norway, the Prime Minister of Norway. Welcome, Prime Minister. Before I begin, let me thank the Institute of Politics, which made this event possible. Prime Minister Stoltenberg has held many positions of leadership within his country and has dedicated his life to public service. In fact, he has served in many different roles, as State Secretary, as Minister of Trade and Energy, and even as taxi driver. <laughs> Those of you who are students at the Kennedy School and take one of our courses, for example, how to become a politician, might actually want to go to YouTube and learn about how taxi driving can be really instrumental for your career. The Prime Minister was born in Oslo and studied at the University of Oslo, graduating in 1987 with a degree in social economics. Early in his career, Prime Minister Stoltenberg was a journalist on the national daily Arbeiderbladet, which with my um, Swiss German, I'm going to uh, translate as the workers' paper. He was also leader of the Labour Youth League, as well as the leader of the Oslo Labour Party. Upon entering government, he went on to serve in several roles. As State Secretary at the Ministry of Environment, as the Minister of Trade and Energy, followed by the Minister of Finance. Then, and I might want to call this a stint, he had his first stint as Prime Minister from 2000 to 2001. Prime Minister Stoltenberg is very engaged in development issues, as all of you know, and is a strong supporter of the United Nations. He recently stated at the UN General Assembly that the world faces two great challenges, to fight poverty and to fight global warming, and we cannot choose between them. He has served as a member of the board of the Global Vaccine Fund and as a member of the Norwegian Defense Commission, where he headed the government's commission on male roles. So, I'm also serving as a director of the Women and Public Policy Program, a research center here at the Kennedy School, and I had to ask someone beforehand, is this really about man's role in society? Indeed, it is. So much we can learn from Norway. <laughs> Stoltenberg has been the prime minister since 2005, and in fact, has served two terms. Now, on a more serious subject. He was dubbed as the voice of Jutuja, for his stirring speeches that also sent chills around the world and rallied the Norwegians after the devastating attacks in 2011. But he declared, we will never renounce our values. Our answer is more democracy, more openness, and more humanity. Prime Minister, we thank you for your service, for your dedication, and for your inspiration to all of us. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Jens Stoltenberg. Faculty members, students, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. And there are several reasons why it is a great pleasure. First of all, it is a great honor to just be at this university. The, uh, most recognized, uh, the most well-known university of the world, and just to be here is an honor. And in addition, it is an universi uh, a university with uh, close ties uh, with Norway. Uh, many Norwegian students have studied here, and that creates uh, close bonds between our, uh, our country and uh, this university. The second reason why it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here tonight is that uh, I have an old secret longing for uh, the academic world. Because actually I have only made one real decision related to my professional career. And that was to not become a politician. I decided back in 1981 to leave politics because I regarded politics as something too much focused on conflicts, too shallow, uh, to uninformed, uh, so I was going to be something, what should I say, important. 
So I decided to uh, go into research. I uh, started to work in the research department uh, in the Central Bureau of Statistics in Norway with a lot of mathematics. Uh, I can't uh, remember <laughs> so much of it today, <laughs> but it was very complicated and very important. Uh, I stayed there for two years, and then I was asked to become the state secretary, state secretary in the Ministry of Environment. And I decided to just leave this research world, the academic world, for a short period. I have stayed in politics for 23 years since then. <laughs> but I still have leave from my position in the research department back in the Central Bureau of Statistics. And they are, I think they all vote for my party because they were afraid that I would come back. <laughs> so that's the other reason why I really appreciate to be here, to have the feeling, to, to, to smell the atmosphere of an academic institution, uh, a place which I, my plan was to uh, not work at Harvard, but at least be in something, something which is some a parallel or have something in common, uh, a place where people are educated, where you're doing a lot of uh, impressive research. But the third reason why I am happy to be here tonight is of course that uh, you have asked me to speak about a topic which is close to my heart and uh, which I have devoted much, much of my political life to, 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 to manage, and that is the question of how to manage uh, uh, oil and gas revenues, how to manage the oil wealth of Norway, and how to avoid that oil income becomes a curse, uh, and that we instead manage to make the oil revenue to a blessing. And this is of course important for Norway because we have the oil and gas revenues. But it's also important for many other countries because there are many other countries with huge income from natural resources. And uh, it's uh, uh, easy to assume that if you have a lot of natural resources, you tend to have higher income, higher economic growth than if you don't have natural resources. But in fact, in reality, the picture is much more complicated than that. Because if you look at the facts and the empiric, uh, uh, then, uh, and at the statistic uh, and, and at the, the, the different analysis which has been made, we see that actually there is a tendency that it, it is the opposite way. That the more natural resources a country has, the lower is the economic growth. And this chart shows the uh, uh, percentage of natural resources of uh, the total exports earnings uh, compared with GDP growth per capita. And if there is any relationship, it is not positive, it is negative. The more natural resources, the lower economic growth per capita. And then the question is, how is that possible? That if there is any relation, it's negative. That if you have if you are rich on natural resources, your economic growth becomes lower, not higher. Uh, and there are different ways of explaining this. It's partly complicated, but the short answer is that if you have too much cash, if the state earns too much money, it tends to spend too much too fast. And if you spend too much too fast, you destroy the traditional part of the economy, uh, you overheat the economy, prices will increase, wages will increase, and labor will move from the competitive part of the economy, from the exposed uh, part of the economy, from the tradable sector to the sheltered service sector, and the productivity of the economy will decrease. And since oil and gas revenues tends to increase and then go down, when the oil and gas revenue then falls, then you are really in deep trouble because you have, in a way, based your expenditures, the whole economy and the structure of the economy on very heavily spending oil, oil and gas revenue. This is not only in theory, this has happened in reality, and uh, it has taken different forms, but the main problem is that you spend too much too fast. It's called Dutch disease because this happened in Holland in the 1960s and the 1970s. They discovered huge gas reserves. 
they earned a lot of money, but they spent too much of it, and actually they, they experienced uh, negative economic uh, development because they spent too much money too fast. So the, the, the paradox of some kind of negative relationship between high income from natural resources and uh, low or negative economic growth is explained by what is called uh, Dutch disease, uh, the problem of overheating the economy uh, by spending too much of the revenue too fast. Given that that is the fact, that there is a danger for destroying a new economy by having too much income from natural resources, not only oil and gas, but also other natural resources, then Norway is in the danger zone because we are exactly in the position where much of our economy is uh, 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 yeah, so, so influenced by or, or, or the oil and gas sector has great impact on our, uh, on our economy. Around one quarter of our total investments, around one quarter of our total production, GDP, and uh, is from the oil and gas. Uh, around uh, one third of our state revenues comes from oil and gas uh, uh, taxes uh, revenues, and 50% of our uh, exports comes from uh, oil and gas. And again, this is relevant for Norway, but there are many, many other countries in the world in similar positions which, which are facing the same kind of challenges we are facing with this huge uh, temporary uh, income from uh, natural uh, resources. So if there is a danger for oil curse, Norway is really exposed to that danger. But we have managed to avoid the oil curse. The, the oil and gas revenue has been a blessing for Norway. And then the question is, how have Norway managed to avoid the oil curse? And I will briefly mention three reasons or three strategies we have pursued to avoid the oil curse, to avoid that the oil and gas revenues creates more problems than they create advantages for uh, Norway. And strategy number one is to separate the earnings from the spending of oil and gas uh, uh, money. Uh, and the reason why we have to separate earnings from spending is that what characterized, characterized uh, income from a natural resource, especially oil and gas, is partly that they fluctuate with the prices. You see that on this chart. And partly that they will sooner or later go down. Normally, you will say that the responsible fiscal policy will to have income equal expenditures. But in countries like Norway, that will be irresponsible to have a balanced budget. You have to have a budget where the spendings are separated from the earnings. And uh, Norway have, has tried to do that by uh, establishing a pension fund or a, uh, a sovereign wealth fund. And all our oil and gas revenues goes by law into that fund. And the only thing we spend is the financial return from the fund. So actually we, don't, we, we spend zero oil and gas revenue. What we spend is the financial income from the fund, never the installments. And in that way the fund can last forever because we we don't spend the installments, but we spend only the expected financial real return. Uh, and, uh, um, and by doing that, we have been able to yeah, separate earnings from, uh, from uh, uh, spending. Uh, and this is illustrated by this chart. The orange line is the same as the last one. It's the earnings, the net oil revenues. The gray line is the spending. And as you see, the spending of oil and gas revenues is much more stable and a much lower level than the earning. And I have to tell you that it's quite difficult to not spend money. 
Yeah, because if you have a big surplus, it's hard to explain why you don't have billions for all other purposes. And it's also hard to explain why we should have relatively high taxes when you have all this cash flow coming into the uh, state budget. And the problem in Europe with the deficits and the debt crisis is that in many European countries have spent money they don't have. The problem in Norway is that we don't spend money we have. <laughs> and that's also what's a, another challenge. And it, 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 uh, it requires some kind of political courage to say, no, no, <laughs> we keep the tax aside, we don't spend money, we save the money. But we are managed, and the gray line is the actual spending. The dotted gray, li gray line is, is the expected return in the future. And if you see, actually now we are a bit below. So actually the expected return on our financial, on our uh, pension fund is 4%. But now we spend only about around 3 And that's because in addition to have a long-term guideline of not spending more than the real return, which is expected to be 4%, we are also conducting contra-cycle policies, which means that when it's low unemployment, high growth, we actually spend less than 4%. So now we are, we are, we are, 4% is quite, uh, it's, it's not very much out of a big fund. But now we spend actually less than little. And that's uh, even more uh, demanding. Um, okay, this is, this is uh, uh, the way we have been able to separate earnings from spending, which is strategy number one and perhaps the most important way to uh, avoid the oil curse. This has <coughs> led to a build-up of the pension fund. And this is the pension fund uh, now equals around 700 billion US uh, dollars. That m uh, m may be not so much money in the US, but it's much money in Norway. Uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, more than twice our GDP. And it's still increasing. And uh, I had the honor of, do you see this dot? No. No, but back in, uh, no, somewhere, no. It's not there, you see. Oh, I don't know. There's no dot. No. Okay, but back in 1996, I became a Minister of Finance. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and then we started really to invest. Partly in uh, the gray is bonds. 40% of the pension fund is invested in bonds. 60% in equity. And I remember, I will not mention the countries, but I traveled around and met people representing other sovereign wealth funds. And they told me that Norway now, now had a unique chance to buy big, big companies. And, I, and then they mentioned a lot of big banks and car producers and, and we should buy them. Some more hotels, and I remember you know, fascinating things to buy. <laughs> that was the idea to be a big strategic investor. But Norway decided the, the opposite. We decided instead of being big in some few companies, we decided to be small in many, many companies. So now we invest in more than 7,000 uh, companies, listed companies around the world. 7,400 actually. And the average ownership is 1.25% and maximum 10. So instead of, what should I say, investing heavily in few companies, we spread our assets around the whole world in many different companies and thereby reduce the risk and actually we are following the world stock market up and down. And then 40% uh, in bonds and the black thing I still I don't have any ah, somewhere here. Not there it is. No. Oh, it does show on the screen. In Norway it does, but uh, <laughs> yeah. the small black thing there is uh, real estate. So it's 60% in equity, 40% in, in bonds, and 5% in real estate. That's 105%, so that's wrong. 
uh, the, the, the 5% is going to be deducted from bonds. So we're going to reduce a bit in bond and, 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 and go a bit into uh, real estate. But if you look at 2008, I was prime minister. <laughs> and that was a bad year. Because, you know, the Norwegian state owned shares in Lehman Brothers. We own shares in uh, Fanny Mac. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you call it? Yeah. Fanny May and something Mac. Yeah. And, and you know, we lost, we lost heavily. And it was not easy to explain to Norwegian taxpayers in 2008 that we taxed them. And we put the money into this Lehman Brothers and others success uh, stories and lose them. But you see, but actually in 2008, we bought shares. We invested heavily also in 2008. And that has been some of the most profitable investments we ever made. Because we buy every year and we buy also, and actually we buy more equity when shares are going down. Because we have decided that 60% of the pension fund shall be invested in, in equity. So equity prices are going down, we have to buy. To, to meet the 60% target. So we are buying when people are selling, and selling when people are buying, and we are earning a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's the pension fund. But, but, but the clue, or the important thing with the pension fund is that it is invested abroad. But as soon as you, because it, as soon as you start to invest it domestically, then you are, in a way, going around the whole purpose because the whole idea with the pension fund, with, with the separation of earnings and, and spending, is to not to spend in Norway. Because as soon as you start to spend in Norway, you are creating a state budget number two, you undermine the priorities in the state's budget, and you contribute to the overheating of the economy, which was exactly the purpose of establishing the fund. So it's a strong wish in Norway to spend more money in Norway. But the whole idea of the fund is to not to do it. OK, that's the pension fund. Uh, that's uh, uh, why we invest abroad. And, uh, and that's uh, why we yeah, have built, and, and still increasing, uh, of course. That's strategy number one. Separate earnings from spending. Establish a pension fund, invest abroad, and only spend the financial return then the fund will last forever, real return. The second strategy is to keep people at work. Uh, because even if oil and gas is important for our national wealth, uh, the value of labor is much more important. This figure shows the value of the oil and gas in the ground, financial assets, it's the uh, pension fund, and real capital is yeah, uh, factories and roads and so on. The red thing is the net present value of labor, of the fact that people are working. So much more important than oil and gas is the fact that Norwegians are going to work every morning and what they produce of income to the country. And um, in the long run, petroleum revenues are no more than a welcome addition to our economy, to what uh, income created by uh, the fact that people are working. So therefore, the other strategy to avoid the oil curse is to keep many people uh, yeah, in the labor market, uh, high employment rates. And we also managed to keep a quite high employment rate. This is employment rate uh, among women, the dark, or the black one, and the orange is total. And if you see, we have employment rates which are among the highest in the world. It's not so much higher than, uh, it's higher also than compared to the United States, but at least higher than uh, the Euro area. And, just to, and, and, and especially among elderly people, partly because of pension reform, which we have just implemented in Norway, uh, but also especially among women, we have high employment rates. 
There are hardly any other country in the world where women are taking more part in the labor force than in Norway. And the very special thing is that they also have high birth rates. And that was the issue of this uh, commission on male. That was my first official posting. Or, or, uh, yeah, uh, the first official thing I did was to share the commission on the role of male or men in the Norwegian society. It I can tell you about that next time because it's actually even more fascinating than oil and gas. <laughs> um, but just to illustrate the importance of the high employment rate of women, is that if we had the, had the same employment rate among women in Norway as the average in the Euro area, that value equals the total value of oil and gas for Norway. So in that sense, women work participation is much more important than the oil and gas in total. So women are a much greater blessing for Norway, of course, than oil and <laughs> in, in all ways, yeah, but also when you just measure it in economic terms. Just that we have a higher degree of employment. Um, and this is something that it doesn't just come by itself. It's a result of a very active uh, family policy. Kindergartens for all starts at one year old. It's, it's not compulsory, but it's, a, it's, it's for everyone who wants it. Low prices, uh, something we, every child in Norway can, can, can go to uh, uh, one year old. Uh, after school clubs, one year parental leave. So if you get a child in Norway, you get paid one year. And, the, and that's also, this is the most important result of the, this commission, because 14 weeks has to be taken by the father. And I took some weeks, and I, was, uh, I never worked that hard in my life. <laughs> uh, uh, so to be a prime minister is nothing compared to be staying alone at home with a newborn child. It's, uh, yeah. so, so, but all this has contributed to the high uh, participation rate in the workforce uh, by women in Norway. Um, so, st more about strategy number two. High employment rates, low unemployment rates is key and of course very important to maintain the uh, strong economic growth uh, in Norway. Strategy number three is to have um, what should I say? Norway is prosperous, not only because many Norwegians work, but we are pros prosperous also because we are efficient in Norway. And many Norwegians don't believe that. So we have to show them st the statistics. <laughs> and we, are, we have had a stronger increase in productivity than most other countries, even a bit stronger than the United States, which has actually had a go quite good development in productivity. So uh, we are, many people work and they are productive when they are uh, at work. We try to create, a, we have a strong public sector in Norway. We have relatively high taxes in Norway. Uh, we have public schools, public pension schemes, public hospitals financed by taxes. But at the same time, we have a competitive private sector. We have good business environment and we don't see it as any kind of contradiction between a big state and a big private sector. Actually opposite. We believe that a well-run, efficient state promotes a dynamic private uh, 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 yeah, so industries uh, sector. Uh, and this is also something which not only is our opinion, but it's also different rankings. And of course, these are different rankings when it comes to good business environment. But on all of them, Norway and the many of the other Nordic countries at least are ranked quite high. And it just illustrates that even if we have yeah, strong trade unions, big public sector, relatively high taxes, we have a very competitive private sector in Norway. So it is all of this, and actually much more, that has made it possible for Norway 
to transfer the oil and gas income into a blessing, not into a curse. The separation of earning from spending, the high employment rates, and the good business environment for private dynamic sector has altogether made it possible for us to uh, say that our oil and gas revenues has been something which has been good for the Norwegian economy. That is possible to illustrate in many ways, but I believe that the best way of illustrating that is by this figure. Because very often it is said or stated that we have to choose between efficiency and equality. That there is some kind of trade-off between an equal society, equal distribution, and an efficient, productive society. The Norwegian message is the opposite. Is that actually if you have an equal distribution of income, of wealth, equal distribution between men and women, more people will participate, more people will contribute, more people will be in the workforce and actually create greater wealth. And the important thing with this one is that we have Norway, you know, the, the, the horizontal axis is, uh, uh, is, is, is uh, GDP per capita, and the vertical axis is, is uh, a measure of uh, inequality. The higher, uh, the more inequality, the lower, the less inequality measured by Gini uh, coefficients. And if you look at that chart, you will see that Norway is in an area where no country has ever been before. Rich and with equal distribution. What is called Norway mainland or mainland Norway, that is Norway excluded oil. So even when you exclude oil, we are almost as rich as the United States. But the United States has much less equal distribution. Uh, and with oil, we are richer and more equal. And I can hardly think about any better measure that we are being able to earn high incomes, but also distribute them in a fair way between the people in our country. So this is uh, as short as I'm able to do it to explain you how we have tried to make the oil and gas revenues to a blessing and not to a curse in Norway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We We'll now take questions. We have four microphones, two on the floor here and two up there on the balcony. And most of you know the ground rules. Please introduce yourselves first, then do ask a question and one question. And questions at Harvard do end with a question mark. First question. Hi, my name is Megan McHugh. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, so the United States has a good amount of gas and oil resources that have gone untapped. And some have suggested that we look to the Norwegian model of the sovereign wealth fund as a way that we could try to combat some of our problems with debt and spending in the United States. However, a lot of the problems in the United States seem to be that most of the oil wealth um, is funneling into the private sector and private hands. It's making individuals wealthy, but not the state as a whole. People say that trying to um, make the reserves under complete government control would be kind of, the politics of that would be nearly impossible to overcome. How has, how have you combated that in Norway? You said there's a great balance between the public and the private sector. Thank you. First of all, I would be very reluctant to tell anyone in the United States what they shall do, because every country has their own national, as I say, experiences, history, uh, 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 environment for making political decisions. So I don't think that countries can copy each other. But I think that we can inspire each other and that we can learn from each other. So what I can do is to tell what Norway did and what Norway is doing. And then people, politicians in other countries have to look if there are anything they can learn from us. And then just then to answer, what we have done in Norway is to say that the natural resources in the ground that's something we own in common. It's not private ownership. 
So the natural the oil and gas in the continental shelf is the ownership of the Norwegian state by law. But then we invite foreign companies to invest, to, to, to produce, and then of course they can sell oil and gas, but partly we tax them quite heavily. It's 78% tax rate. And they told us that was impossible. But they come <laughs> and invest. <laughs> and, uh, and we tax them and they stay. <laughs> because they earn money even with a tax rate of 78%. Second, large part of the Norwegian oil and gas is also not not managed by the oil and gas uh, companies, but uh, actually directly owned by the Norwegian state. So we have two sources of revenue, partly by taxing the companies, but also partly by direct ownership. But just, but just to, 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 to add one more thing is that even if you have this strong state ownership to the resources, we have a very competitive oil and gas sector. We have, we have many foreign companies, and, and, and we, are very looking, we, are, we are very much looking for competition. So we believe in the market, we believe in the competition, we believe in the open economy, but we believe that the extra rent, the, the, the connected to natural resources, shall be something which is uh, in the common ownership uh, of the people of Norway, and that's why we have the strong uh, state participation. Hi, my name is Isha Kare, and I'm a freshman at Harvard College. I had a question from the environmental standpoint. So oil, oil is a crucial part of the Norwegian economy, but when we look for future generations in terms of climate change and environmental policy, how do you balance economic efficiency with um, looking towards the future and climate change and environment? That is the biggest dilemma of the world, and that is how to reconcile the need for strong economic growth, which we need to alleviate poverty, with the need for reduced emissions uh, of greenhouse gases. And what we try to do in Norway uh, uh, is several, or we, we try to do several things. One is to, you know, the oil production is going down. What is in going up in Norway is gas. Oil production has actually been reduced by 50% since 2000, while gas production is increasing. And as in the United States, we see that gas is substituting coal. So coal, uh, gas is actually contributing to lower emissions uh, in U.S., and actually contributing also to lower emissions in Europe by uh, substituting gas with uh, oil, uh, coal with uh, gas. Uh, second, we are investing heavily in the development of renewables. Uh, we have a strong hydropower uh, sector in Norway, but we also now try to develop wind power, other kinds of renewable uh, clean energy in Norway. And thirdly, we also uh, work on uh, projects related to carbon capture and storage. Uh, to try to develop technology which can capture the carbon dioxide from uh, power plants and then uh, store them into uh, uh, the ground. Hi, my name is Aliza Hashmi and I'm a junior at Harvard College. I'm also a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee and on behalf of the committee, I'd like to ask the official Twitter question. The question is, what are you planning to do following the end of your term? In particular, do you plan on staying involved in politics? <laughs> yes, I plan to stay on in politics. You know, this is the fourth time I leave government. Uh, I left government when I left the Minister of Environment in 1991. And I stayed in the parliament for two years and then suddenly I was back uh, as uh, Minister for Industry and Energy. And then uh, I left government in 97. Uh, as, min uh, as Minister for Finance, and uh, I came back as, uh, as Prime Minister, and I left government again in 2001 when we lost elections, but then we won in 2005 and 2009. So I've been Prime Minister for 10 years in total. And uh, uh, the experience is that when we leave, go uh, leave government, we stay in opposition uh, for a while, and then we're back. Uh, <laughs> so. And, and, and actually, my party, we, 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 are, we, are, we are a coalition government, and, uh, and, uh, and we lost the votes. But uh, my party became the biggest party in Norway, and we are still, uh, and we did uh, a reasonable good election. So uh, we are in good mood, uh, even if we are not in government. And it's part of democracy also to sometimes stay in opposition. 
Uh, good evening, Prime Minister Stoltenberg. Um, my name is Nancy Koh. I'm a freshman at the college. My question is, um, I obviously, um, Norway has faced a lot of success, um, but how much is, if, of this success is facilitated by the fact that Norway and many of these other successful countries, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, um, are ethnic, ethnically homogenous, um, of small size, and have little social unrest? And how can diverse countries such as the United States um, or countries that face unrest like Mexico um, translate the success of Norway uh, to apply for their own countries? You are quite right, that, and, and that's the reason why it's impossible to say that a country, I mean, United States cannot copy Norway. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's possible at all, or Mexico, whatever. But I'm, but I'm saying that there are lessons to be learned. And I mean, I, Mexico, or, 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 you know, in the beginning I had this, uh, this other one, uh, the first one, showing that there are countries with huge oil and gas revenues which actually have had quite bad economic development. And one reason why they have had that is that they have spent too much. And at least one lesson is to not spend too much money. <laughs> and, and, and spending money is partly something you do by spending too much on the state budget. But it's also something you do by reducing taxes. Because when you, s I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, our, our oil and gas uh, spending is, is the deficit before oil and gas, if you understand what I mean. I mean. If you reduce taxes and keep up spending, then you have to use more oil and gas revenues. So there are two ways of reducing oil and gas spending. It's either increasing taxes or reducing spending, or at least not reduce the taxes. So I, I'm not going to, to give any concrete lessons to any of these countries, but I, I, but I know some of them have spent too much money. So be, and that's, it's possible not to spend money also in other countries than Norway. Yeah. Hi, uh, Prime Minister. Thank you for your speech. Thank you for sharing the Norwegian success story. My name is Nii Yong. I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from another successful country, Singapore. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it is, uh, it's a small country that, has, uh, that is undergoing some problems right now. Um, Norway has been able to sustain very high productivity rates, sustain very high fertility rates. It's, it's, an, it's a stage where many East Asian countries like Korea and Singapore are trying to emulate. Um, can you share with us how you were able to sustain such a high fertility rate and such high productivity rate, and including high labor force participation rates among females, which have become the envy of Asian countries? And also, could you also share with us how you were able to sustain such high returns for the Norges Fund? For, uh, for the Norges Fund, the oil fund that uh, Norway has, uh, 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 uh. despite having such high levels of disclosures mm. among, when you compare them ag among sovereign wealth funds around the world. I mean, like there are the Middle Eastern or some Asian sovereign wealth funds which may not be as transparent as the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund. You guys have very clear stipulated guidelines on what you can invest and what you can't invest. You guys don't inv invest in arms companies, for example. So it would be great to share, share with us some of your experiences. Thank you so much. So first, related to the, uh, so first of all, there are many successful countries in the world, and there are many different reasons. Uh, and, and, and I also would like to add one more thing, is that there are problems in Norway. I mean, I mean <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. so uh, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that, even if there are many people in the workforce, there are also many people outside the workforce on disability schemes and so on. We have too many people are dropouts from schools. And, uh, and of course, we have very high uh, cost uh, or wage level in Norway, which makes us vulnerable to, 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 to uh, decreased uh, uh, demand from, uh, from other countries for our export commodities and so on. So, so, so it's, yes, the overall picture is that we have managed in Norway, but yes, there are problems and there are challenges and we are vulnerable. Um, uh, but then you asked about the uh, uh, fertility rates. So first of all, it's not politicians uh, only that decides how many children uh, women are. Uh, it's it's a very, very much a, something which is decided individually by by people themselves, uh, at least in Norway. But uh, <laughs> but 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 then my message is that actually the high fertility rates in Norway is something which is at least partly a result of political decisions. And then when I say high, it's high compared to other European countries. So it's not high compared to Africa or Asia or whatever, but it's, it's close to two per woman, which is quite high to be a, 
advanced industrialized country in, in Europe. Uh, and, 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 and what I tried to, uh, to say in my introduction is that one, or one of the reasons why we have been able to actually increase the fertility rates is a family policy. Because when you have kindergartens from the age of one, then of course it's easier to combine a work life, education for women and men with having children. When you have one year paid parental leave and 14 weeks for the father, <laughs> then it does something with the whole family structure and uh, after school clubs and, 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 and these kind of things has actually increased our fertility rates from the 1970s, 1980s when they went down. Uh, and that's the explanation. When it comes to the return for the, uh, on the pension fund, I think the most important answer is that we have, we have not, set, our, ambition, our ambition is not to, to beat the market. Our ambition is to follow the market. So we invest uh, according to indices or indexes all around the world in all, all major stock markets. And we invest in almost all companies. And then when the market goes down, we go down. When it goes up, it goes up. And uh, we pay many people for doing exactly that. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Statsminister Takka for att komma och snacka med oss idag. Yeah. Um, my name is Matt Stolhanske. I'm a senior research and teaching fellow here at the Kennedy School. And my, I was going to ask you something economic, but I decided I wanted to change it up a little bit and get your thoughts on politics. Um, as um, Ernest Holberg and the Höyre goes into conversations uh, about building the coalition, um, especially as they're engaging with the Progress Party, which is still perceived by many to be a racist anti-immigrant party in Norway, if you put your consultant hat on for that coalition building exercise, what do you suggest uh, for Norway moving forward? How do you engage those parties in a way that is going to uh, mitigate as much risk as possible for the country moving forward and make it as a productive and positive um, right-wing party as possible uh, in the next coming years? You mean I should give them advice? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I have spent the whole election campaign to give them advice, but they didn't listen. So, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah. and I also feel that to be abroad, to be in Boston and at Harvard, and, and then to give advice to uh, the four parties, which have, they have one thing in common, and that is that they don't want me. Uh, uh, and uh, I respect that, uh, even if I <laughs> don't agree. Uh, and uh, and uh, and they are now negotiating. And uh, and I think that you and there are four different parties. And I respect that the voters voted for them. Uh, but there are big differences between the parties. And therefore, it's too early to say what kind of policy this uh, new government will pursue, uh, because there are big differences between the Christian Democratic Party, Liberal Party. Uh, uh, a progressive party and a uh, uh, traditional conservative party. So uh, it's, it's a good question, but I, I think I will answer as a politician, speak a lot without saying so much. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. My name is Neha Dalal. I'm also a member of the Junior Forum Committee here. Um, and I'm asking this question also on behalf of the committee. So government policies are always evolving to take in to, um, to take into account new circumstances. So particularly regarding oil, how do you see particularly Norway's oil policy changing? And then also just looking at the world at large, what are the biggest changes that we can look forward to, or I guess not look forward to in the next few years? You, you just to understand uh, the, the changes in Norwegian policy. In oil policy, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, again, when it comes to the new government, it's hard to say anything for certain because there are, there are four parties which are now negotiating. I am, I'm still the prime minister, but uh, the, the plan is that I, or I will resign the 14th of October and, uh, and, uh, and then they most probably will form, uh, or they will form a new government, but we don't know what kind of policy. Uh, but I believe uh, that when it comes to oil and gas, uh, I think that it's, it's quite stable. Uh, not big changes, uh, and that uh, we will have a policy uh, which uh, facilitate investments both in oil and gas, new fields. There are some areas which are very disputed at the Norwegian continental shelf, but that was disputed in my government and it is disputed in the new government, so that's the same. Uh, and, um, 
And, uh, and the, the, the big thing in Norway is that we are now opening up the areas in the Barents Baren Sea and the Polar Sea or in the uh, Arctic. I know that's controversial, but you know, more than half of Norway is in the Arctic. So I, I meet people who speak about Arctic as a place uh, uh, polar bears and, uh, and ice, but Norwegians are living there. Uh, uh, most of Norway is in the Arctic, and uh, so it's hard to know to have any activity. And, and we have had uh, oil and gas activity in the Arctic for decades. Uh, but now we are exploring new areas, and we uh, managed to agree on a delimitation line with Russia. So we are also opening up new areas uh, towards them. And I think that regardless of what kind of government we will have in Norway, these are areas which are going to be uh, go going to be activities, and it's going to be very exciting. And we have made some new discoveries in those areas. Thanks. Please. Hi, thank you so much, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Jose Morales. I come from Venezuela, and in Venezuela, many uh, NGOs that defend human rights uh, are actually financed uh, by the Norwegian government. So I don't know if it's uh, oil money, the financial income, or taxpayer, but thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, in Venezuela, we have a, let's say, slightly more convoluted institutional system, mm -hmm. and, and something that <laughs> Something that happens there uh, is that oil ha uh, takes the country into a very weird political trap in the sense that uh, the country, uh, I mean, the stakes of being in office are so high that there's no, th there's no uh, conversation going on between the opposition and the government and no policy debate can be addressed sincerely in the public sphere. But surprisingly, oil is totally absent of the public sphere. Oil is not mm -hmm. present in the debate and uh, and, and in a way, people's relationship with oil is as the, the way in which they depend from the government. Mm -hmm. And several, several authors and several uh, uh, people in the Venezuelan public sphere started to suggest that maybe the proposition of distributing uh, natural resource uh, rents directly to, th to citizens could help uh, uh, circumvent uh, the political economy trap that we're in. Uh, in the sense that maybe we, in that way we can uh, reverse the dependency relationship between the government and the citizens. So in that sense, I wanted to ask what your take is uh, with regard to uh, direct distribution of oil rents to citizens. Thank you very much. So we, we, we don't, it depends what you mean with direct distribution. We don't have any direct distribution of oil rent to the citizens of Norway. What we do is that we save the oil rent actually. So what, uh, what all, of, all of the oil revenue goes in, 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 into the pension fund. So what we spend is, actually, as I said, the financial return on the fund, and only that. And that, and that goes just into the state budget. Correct, correct but yeah. it, like, hypothetically, if the debate was presented in Norway, what would you think of that possibility of? Yeah, but, uh, and, and I would be against it. Uh, because I believe that we, it much, uh, for, partly because it, it, that's, the, that's, that's to start the Dutch disease. I mean, if, if, you, if you try to in a way, throw out oil money, uh, I mean, about whatever purpose, but, but you, you just increase domestic demand too much. That's the beginning of, of the disease of the oil curse. So, so the whole thing is that it is dangerous for any economy to have a too strong increase in demand if you don't have the capacity to absorb it. And that, and that is in a way, regardless of what you spend it on, private consumption or, or public expenditures, it demands people, capacity in the economy, and the economy doesn't have enough capacity to absorb this kind of money in, uh, during a short period of time. So the whole idea is to not spend the money. That's the, that's the beauty of uh, oil money. And, uh, and then you only spend, as I say, in a gradual way, the return. But you know, that increases every year. Because since the pension fund increases, the return on the uh, 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 fund increases. But it's a gradual increase in, in spending. But when it comes to Venezuela, I think that the, the most important lesson, or one lesson from Norway is to not spend too much money. The other lesson is to be tra transparent. We are extremely transparent. And we are very, very open for competition. It's a level playing field. There's a transparent, uh, predictable framework for oil companies. And therefore, we have the most efficient companies. We have reduced costs. 
and we welcome, and, and again, if they save a dollar, we tax them 78 cents. So we are very interested in efficient competitive companies because it increases our income and also theirs. Yeah. We have time for three more questions. We'll take one here, one here, and we'll end with you. Thank you, Prime Minister. My name is Karnikolai Westman. I'm uh, from Norway. Um, I just became a father on Friday, oh, and uh, I would like to thank you for the paternity <laughs> leave. Um, <laughs> I will, I will take five months paternity leave next year and uh, allow my wife uh, to have the same opportunity as me, uh, go back to work. Uh, my question is regarding your uh, speech at the UN, uh, where the number one goal is to fight poverty. Is it not a dilemma that the petroleum fund being so big, uh, funding quite a few financial managers around the world and not taking active decisions in investing, could we not do more to fight poverty with the excess wealth that we have, since it is an excess wealth? First of all, I believe that we are fighting poverty just by investing. And we are investing more and more of our pension fund in emerging economy in developing uh, uh, countries. But, but, but we, we are only investing in, what should I say, recognized stock markets, listed companies. So of course, some of the poorest countries we are not able to invest in but we are investing more and more in what is traditionally called as developing or emerging economies. That, of course, increases the capacity of their economy and increases their economic growth. Second, uh, I think that the main tool from Norway to promote growth in the developing world is not the pension fund, but it is our development aid. And we are among the, I think perhaps the only, but at least among the very few countries in the world which allocates 1% of GDP for development aid or overseas uh, official development aid. And, uh, and I have been very, a very strong advocate for using more on that money on basic education and basic health. So we are, for instance, financing a lot of immunization of children all around the world, maternal health. And we do it, for instance, together with the Gates Foundation because we believe that if Gates can spend money on something, it's wise of us to spend money on the same thing. It has been, <laughs> yeah. So to immunize a child, Bill Gates said that it's the best investment he ever made, and we are following him. And, and that's outside the pension fund. It's, it's from the revenue we earn, we spend that on development aid. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Stoltenberg, um, my name is David Samuelson. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm also a social democrat from Sweden, so I yeah. welcome you. I, I, um, um, I want to ask you a question on the political implications in Norway mm -hmm. of not spending the oil money. Uh, for me, uh, is a great concern of the rights of the uh, right-wing populist uh, Progress Party, the Fremskrits Party. Uh, they now seem to perhaps going to enter the government. And, and that uh, is, um, do you think that is a result of you not spending the oil money and they say that they could, they could spend more and therefore you have this right-wing turn? At least, uh, at least it has been an important part of the election campaign in Norway has been the discussion about spending or not spending oil revenue. And you are right that the uh, Progress Party, they have been very strong in, favor, strong in favor of spending more money, partly to spend money on reduced taxes and partly spending money on uh, increased public expenditures. And that's that makes Norway a bit different compared to many other countries because in Norway it's possible to be in favor of both reducing taxes and increasing public expenditures because you have uh, the huge surplus. And, and, and in that sense, I think you're right that that's at least uh, for, for many of those who, who, who support that party, that's, that's one of the main reasons why they do so. But again, that's democracy. I, I'm, I'm arguing for our policy and at least uh, there are more people voting for my party than the other party, so we are the biggest party still. <laughs> yeah. Last question. Hello. Hello, my name is uh, John Kidenda, and I'm a master's in public administration and international development here at the Kennedy School. I come from Kenya, a country that just last year discovered oil. Mm. And uh, this is something that's happened in Uganda, something that's happened in Tanzania. I'm thankful that we have some leeway uh, in terms of the time it'll take to develop these newfound resources. Um, I know you've said you, it's not your place to directly advise countries on what they should do. My question is, is there any thought about setting up 
uh, some structure where some of the best practices that you guys have uh, 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 put in place in Norway can be accessible um, to countries like mine that are facing the same situation with neighbors that have suffered have very heavily from Dutch disease. Uh, I think it, it would be uh, setting up a framework that is accessible to decision makers in countries like mine mm. uh, would be very helpful and I'm wondering if there's any thought on that. Norway is more than willing to share our experience when it comes to the management of the oil and gas revenues. And partly we do it just by being completely transparent. All investments of the pension fund are, are available on the internet. Every Norwegian can just go and look at every share. And we own uh, shares or equities in 7,400 companies. And, and, and it's completely transparent. And the guidelines, the decisions, everything is available for everyone. Uh, second, we have different programs where we actually share our experience, especially with uh, countries in the, in the third world or developing countries. I don't know if I have that kind of cooperation with, with Kenya, but we have it in many other countries. We have a program called Oil for Development, where we actually uh, yeah, tell, learn, educate people in other countries about how we have developed our uh, regulatory framework, our tax system, the pension fund, and again, even if it's not possible to copy, of course, some of the structure, some of the transparency, some of the regulatory framework is also applicable for other countries, like, for instance, Kenya. So, uh, so we, we do that in many countries, and perhaps you also should, can, can do it in the future with, with your country. Prime Minister Stoltenberg, thank you so much for your insightful comments, for your inspiring uh, leadership, including thought leadership in the world. There's certainly a lot that the world can learn from you in terms of equality, including gender equality, in terms of transparency, and in terms of fiscal discipline. And I'm sure many of you, like I, look forward to the day when many of us can also say that our biggest problem is not to spend the money that we have. <laughs> With that, thank you very much.